This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. It's a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. It's a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. The Exxon comes to you Monday through Friday from 10 p.m. Eastern until 2 a.m. Eastern right here on the Talk Star Radio Network from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Our toll-free number is 1-877-528-8255. That's toll-free throughout the U.S., Canada, Alaska, and Hawaii at 1-877-528-8255. My email address is xzone at talkstarradio.com. On MSN Messenger, talkstarradio at hotmail.com. And our websites www.xzoneradio.com and if you'd like to watch, listen, and chat with the coolest radio audience anywhere www.xzonetv.com My producer at Master Control in Titusville, Florida is the one and only Miss Melanie and my um, chat room moderator at Xzone TV is my friend Rob from Scarborough, Ontario on tonight's show, we are going to be talking in a few minutes to Michael Varhola. We're going to be talking about America's haunted road trip. In hour number two, we're going to be talking to a gentleman who's going to tell us why benevolent dictators make the best business leaders. He says small business owners should practice tough love. Dr. Lynn Kitai is going to be joining us in hour number three, talking about the Phoenix Lights. And in hour number four, Zach Barkhouse will be talking to us about Dead Pet Stories. That's live tonight here on the X Zone. This is the only place where we can actually talk to the dead and people will understand what we're talking about. Once again, our toll free number is 1 877 528 8255. That's toll free throughout the U.S., Canada, Alaska, and Hawaii at 1 877 528 8255. My first guest tonight is a gentleman by the name of Michael Varhola. We're going to be talking about Haunted America Road Trip, or America's Haunted Road Trip. And Michael, welcome to the X-Zone. Thank you very much, Rob. I'm glad to be here. Tell me, um, what's America's Haunted Road Trip all about? Well, America's Haunted Road Trip is a concept uh, that is exemplified by a series of travel guides that are Mm -hmm. written by authors who specialize in haunted areas, uh, haunted sites in the areas in which they live. And what each one of these books does uh, is cover somewhere around three dozen uh, publicly accessible haunted sites, purportedly haunted sites. Mm -hmm. The authors don't necessarily have to believe the sites are haunted or prove they're haunted or disprove they're haunted. But um, about three dozen purportedly haunted sites in the region that they're covering um, that people can visit. So these are, in fact, travel guides, and there is actionable information in the various books. And when somebody picks up one of these travel guides, Ghost Hunting Virginia or Ghost Hunting Maryland or any of the others, uh, we don't have vague ghost stories that tell people, well, in a farmhouse outside of Rockville, Maryland, uh, steps can be heard going up the stairs. No, we actually give an address for the place uh, where our story takes place. All right, Michael, stand by. I've got to take a two-minute commercial break. We'll be right back talking to Michael Varhola. He is uh, talking to us about America's Haunted Road Trip here on the X-Zone. He's one of the authors of uh, Ghost Hunting Maryland. 1-877-528-8255 is toll-free. X-Zone at talkstarradio.com is my email address. I'll be back on the other side of this two-minute commercial break, and we're going to be continuing talking about America's Haunted Road Trip here on the X-Zone from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, on Talkstar. This is Kevin Randall. For nearly 30 years, I have been investigating the case of the Roswell UFO. I have interviewed hundreds of people and stood on the crash site. 
Now on Roswell in the 21st century, I have reviewed dozens of hours of audio and videotaped interviews, examined hundreds of files that relate to the crash, and have returned to Roswell in an attempt to put all that information into the proper perspective. For the first time in Roswell in the 21st century, I have made a dispassionate reevaluation of all that material and provide a new look at what happened. This is a book that clears away all the clutter that has hidden the truth for so long, strips away the various lies that surround the case, exposes the Air Force attempts at cover-up, and found a core of solid information that tells us all where the case stands today. Roswell in the 21st Century will be available in just a few weeks. For more information, please visit my website at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. Gibbs A. Williams, Ph.D., is a practicing psychoanalyst, supervisor, researcher, and author in New York City. Much of his life has been dedicated to understanding nature and the uses of meaningful coincidences or synchronicities. His radical and original non-Jungian, non-mystical, non-magical theory of synchronicities illuminates much of the fog surrounding this challenging and perplexing topic. His ideas and manners are fresh, presented in a style that is both entertaining and highly informative. He is also an expert on crisis intervention specially focused on violence reduction for the police and citizens, mastering anxiety, frustration and stress without the use of medication, and effectively preventing and treating heroin addiction. Dr. Williams can be contacted at his email address at gwwilliamsny11 at aol.com or visit his website at www.drgibbswilliams.com. Shamanism is recognized as a method to access the quantum level. Mastery of shamanic skills puts spiritual information and healing power into your hands. Path Home Shamanic Art School, a bonded Colorado certified occupational school, has met rigorous state standards ensuring its director and instructors have the qualifications to teach the shamanic arts. Path Home offers its certification program in blocks of study. Block 1, a five-day intensive, will be held in the beautiful mountain town of Coldale, Colorado, October 13th through 18th. Registration deadline is September 12th. Experience Journey Trance, Power Animals, Helping Spirits, Sacred Space, and Life Purpose. Come discover your power. Join me, Gwilda Wiyaka, in the magical world of shamanism. Call 303-775-3431 or visit findyourpathhome.com. With each new extreme weather event or terrorist act, it becomes increasingly obvious that we live in uncertain and challenging times. We all buy car insurance. Why not collapse and catastrophe insurance? Matthew Stein, an MIT-trained engineer and green builder, has written two outstanding books to help people prepare, plan for, and deal with everything from minor situations lasting a few days to full-on collapse. Matt's first book, When Technology Fails, is a manual for self-reliance, sustainable living, and surviving the long emergency. This massive book covers the gamut from first aid and emergency preparedness to alternative healing, renewable energy, primitive living skills, and 18th century technologies that could be critical to your comfort and survival in a long-lasting crisis. Matt's second book, When Disaster Strikes, is a comprehensive emergency preparedness handbook and survival guide. When Disaster Strikes is an essential item for every family's go-bag. Both books are available at all usual sources. There's a wealth of totally free information posted at whentechfails.com and author signed copies may be purchased at mattstein.com. That's www.wentechfails.com and www.mattstein.com. Michael Varhol is our special guest. Uh, he has had a lifetime, long lifetime interest in the paranormal and conducted investigations worldwide. He is a public speaker, author of several books, and a freelance journalist with a strong background in history, research, and fieldwork. He lives in Virginia, just outside of Washington, D.C. And, uh, Michael, why do you think ghosts and the investigation into the paranormal is so popular these days? Well, in the introduction to my book, uh, I'm, I'm only half joking, but I'm half serious. Uh, I really date the mainstream and widespread public interest in these kinds of subjects uh, to the X-Files. Uh, that was an incredibly popular television mm -hmm. show, and I think it really brought 
uh, into the forefront of people's minds uh, subjects like this and really helped make them a lot more mainstream. So you've always had people uh, who were interested in the paranormal. You can go back and find writers who were writing about haunted houses 3,000 years ago. So this is nothing new. But I venture to say 10 years ago, most people wouldn't know what you meant if you used a phrase like ghost hunting. So this is a, a, a concept that has really moved into the forefront of people's minds. And, and I think you can go back to uh, whenever the X-Files came out, early 90s, and, and that's really when I think people started waking up to the idea uh, that this is something that they, as individuals, could participate in. Now, Michael, where did your interest come from? Well, you know, I grew up in Europe as a child, uh, and I can't tell you any one thing that sparked my interest, but I think living in uh, a very old area, uh, a place where uh, you probably do have more ghosts per capita because it is such an old area, couldn't have hurt. Uh, and, and certainly my interest in history and research and visiting historical sites came from growing up in Europe and, and visiting things like the uh, Normandy battlefield on the 30th anniversary of D-Day. Mm -hmm. Being able to do those sorts of things as a kid uh, just sort of awakened all of the interests that I have. And, and ghost hunting and the paranormal uh, are just one. Uh, and it's just one that is sort of integrated with everything else that I do and everything else that I'm interested in. Why? So uh, I, I, it's my upbringing and my background, I'd say. Why is it called ghost hunting? Well, you know, Rob, when we want to discuss anything with other people, we are limited by the vocabulary at hand. Mm -hmm. And I am not really wild about that term. Why is it called ghost hunting? I don't know. It really shouldn't be called yeah. ghost hunting. Because when I, you go hunting something, you go to kill it. Ghost watching. Yeah, well, there's a good, that's, a good, uh, that's a good explanation. Because when you go hunting, you go to kill something, and you're not out there to kill the ghost. Yeah, exactly yeah. so. But this is ghost hunting in the sense that a uh, photo safari uh, is, is a safari. Uh, we're there, uh, for the most part, to observe. It's not like Ghostbusters. We're not bringing ghost traps with us and trying mm -hmm. to, uh, to actually capture the ghost. So, so, yeah, it is a bit of a misnomer. Uh, but it's a bit of a melodramatic word, and it's the one that, uh, that caught on. What is the scariest thing that you have ever experienced in your ghost hunting career? Well, in the recent past, I'll give two brief answers to that. In the recent past, I, it would be the various trips that I've made out to a site called Funny Man Bridge in northern Virginia, which just happens to be uh, only eight miles from my house. And I believe it to be uh, a profoundly haunted site, a somewhat malignly haunted site. Uh, and I have uh, actually uh, been brought right up to the verge of, of panic when visiting that site. Uh, and a number of people uh, have been. Uh, many uh, psychic investigators or paranormal researchers have, have had a similar response to that site. I'd say the, the overall scariest, uh, most profoundly terrifying experience I've had doing an investigation was when I was exploring the catacombs under the city of Paris mm. back in 1990, uh, so almost 20 years ago now. Uh, I spent 12 hours in the catacombs with uh, a bunch of um, kids that called themselves tunnel rats, and at one point uh, we stopped to rest, and I fell asleep. And when I woke up, I was laying on top of a sepulcher surrounded by candles in uh, a cavern uh, 120 feet or so beneath the surface of, of the city, huh. and uh, was completely disoriented. And uh, I, I'd say that's probably the most uh, classically nightmarish uh, situation I found myself in while doing something like this. Tell me, pretty quickly, but you only need a few seconds of that. I would uh, imagine to, so. To be pretty scared by it. Tell me, what are some of your theories on what ghosts actually are? Well, you know, I'll go back again to my reference to the vocabulary that we use. We've got to use a common vocabulary, and the, the term we use to describe certain phenomena is ghost. I think you're dealing with two different things when you go out to, to most haunted sites. One is what ghost hunters call a residual haunting. And there, really, what you're looking at is, is a psychic video. Uh, you're looking at some scene or image from the past mm -hmm. that ends up replaying itself. So I think uh, a large proportion of the classic hauntings people talk about are these unintelligent, uninteractive, 
uh, residual hauntings, uh, which are some sort of psychic impression uh, left by a very traumatic event in the past. So it's yeah, like an imprint in time. What's that? It's like an imprint in time. Exactly so. So we use the word ghost to describe that, uh, mm -hmm. and the word ghost implies a sort of undead presence, and that may or may not actually be what we're looking at. Uh, but but that, that's, that's the one sort, and I think that's the most common sort of haunting. And then you've got a uh, more active sort of haunting. You've got an intelligent haunting, and that is more of your classic ghost. It's much less common, uh, but that is the ghost that when you watch uh, these ghost hunting television shows will respond uh, when people say, give us a sign, uh, let us know that you're here. It's something that uh, has some degree of awareness. I think in most cases nowhere near the degree of awareness that it had in life, uh, but it, it can be reactive and, and it does interact with people. Is it, possible, uh, is it possible that what a person believes to be a ghost is actually telekinesis or the person's own mind making the, the, uh, the sounds or the determinations or reacting as the ghost? I think that's possible. I, I don't believe that that's the case in, in all instances. Uh, I know a really wonderful academic psychic investigator named Dr. Stephen Browdy, and uh, he's one of the rare, truly academic paranormal investigators. He's the head of the philosophy department at University of Maryland, Baltimore County. So, obviously, being interested in ghost hunting in Maryland right now, I've interacted with him a bit. But um, he believes that all of these phenomena are externalizations of, um, of psychic phenomena. That, that, that's right, uh, that they're some sort of telekinetic yeah. uh, effect. I, I, think, I think most psychic researchers, or a preponderance of them today, acknowledge that a poltergeist is not really a ghost at all. No. A poltergeist is, is some sort of uh, psychic trauma mm -hmm. uh, that's being externalized. But, but no, I, I don't believe that it would be fair to say that that's what all of these things are. I think that breaks down and uh, that that's too pat to be able to try to categorize them all. And it would be uh, really not a whole lot more valid than saying all of them are figments of people's imagination. And I don't think that's accurate either. Um, what other topics do you cover in uh, America's Haunted Road Trip? Uh, do you just cover ghosts? Do you cover, uh, for example, Bigfoot sightings? Do you cover uh, Chupacabra sightings? No, we really don't. We don't cover uh, X creatures or um, uh, other paranormal phenomena per se. Mm -hmm. uh, when I encounter phenomena like that uh, associated with a certain site that I'm investigating, uh, I will we'll talk about that other phenomena. So, for example, there's an area called Berry Hill Road, a road in southern Virginia, and I devote a chapter of that to ghost hunting Virginia, and it has all sorts of weird effects associated with it. It has a, a gravity hill road where cars roll uphill. Uh, it's got uh, sightings of Satan worshippers. So it, it's got a, a lot of other weird peripheral phenomena associated with it, but they wouldn't have made it into the book. They wouldn't have made it into the series unless uh, there was a ghost as well. So witches and demons and all of, of the other associated paranormal phenomena uh, are not covered directly by the America's Haunted Road Trip series. It's really things that can be categorized as ghosts per se that we're covering in this series. But, but, Clarity Press is looking into doing something that covers the paranormal more generally, and I am trying to lead the charge on that. one 877 is toll free throughout the U.S., Canada, Alaska, and Hawaii. My special guest this hour is Michael Varhola. We're talking about America's Haunted Road Trip. And where is the most haunted place in Maryland? The most haunted place in Maryland that I have seen to date is a 300-year-old house in Frederick, Maryland, called the Schifferstadt. And it was built by a couple of German brothers uh, back in the 18th century. And I have seen in uh, the three hours I spent there more uh, anomalies. Uh, in the recordings and photographs that I took than I have seen in, in any other place in Maryland today. Wow. Uh, I, I'd say it's a pretty significantly haunted site, and it's a pretty well-known haunted site. Uh, but I'm, I'm covering it in the book, and it, uh, it is definitely worth a visit for anyone who is, is interested in, uh, in doing an investigation somewhere. Um, and there are a few close runner-ups as well, but if I had to pick one, uh, that, that would be the one. 
Why is it that some people can see ghosts and hear ghosts and other people can't? Well, there could be a number of reasons for that. I think the conventional reason that a lot of people would give uh, is that um, the people who are seeing the ghosts are just making it up. <laughs> so, but, but that's too simple, and, and I don't think it's true. Um, I think most people, you know, if I had to put a number on it, I'd say 90% of people have some sort of sensitivity. They're born with some sort of sensitivity, and then they are just basically trained to suppress it as they get older and progress through life. There are very, very few rewards for being sensitive to things that you can't uh, sense with uh, your, your traditional five senses. Uh, so I would, would venture to say most people have the ability to detect on some level uh, paranormal phenomena, and they just choose to ignore them because, frankly, most people's lives are easier if they don't see these various phenomena. Michael, stand by. We've got to take our news at the bottom of the hour. Exo Nation, we're talking about America's Haunted Road Trip. And uh, Michael Varhol is our special guest. He's one of the authors of Ghost Hunting Maryland that is due to be released in September of 2009. 1-877-528-8255 is toll free throughout the U.S., Canada, Alaska, and Hawaii. My name is Rob McConnell. We'll be back after the news as we continue live and around the world from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada on Talkstar. It was a terrifying experience. I thought we was going to go to jail for murder. That day, you know, we were a little behind, so we worked until it was starting to get dark. We loaded up the equipment and hadn't driven very far when we caught glimmers of this glow coming through the trees. I urged Mike to hurry up and get up there. Travis had the door open before we even stopped. As he got closer, I heard the sound. One of the guys said, you feel that? I really panicked then. I told him, get the hell out of here. It didn't come directly to me. It came to a, a deputy sheriff. Three of us volunteered right away to tell him what had happened. And sheriff Gillespie definitely didn't believe it. He says that we better be certain because we can get in a lot of trouble. When we went to search the next day, they split us up, and the whole time the deputies asked me, you know, if you just tell us where the body is, we can all go home and get this over with. We're talking about a hundred people combing through the wooded area. Nothing turns up. All week long, I've been hearing they're going to set it up to make you guys look guilty. We're a rough-looking bunch then. Some of us have been in trouble with the law before. And y'all ain't never going to come out of that jailhouse. We couldn't get out. I tried to sneak out the back door the day of the polygraph test. I was scared to death. And on top of that, you have media. I literally would be on two telephones at the same time. We even got some coops in here now that's coming in and out to see the freak show, as they call it. Everyone descends. I just wasn't going to stand there and listen to it anymore. Granny says, this is Travis. I'm back. I need help. When I did hear that he had been returned, it was almost as unbelievable as the original thing. I just looked at my mom and says, I told you we didn't kill him. Travis Walton reappeared after several days with a bizarre story about a ride in an unidentified flying object. People were desperate to explain it away. Why are you sticking up with Travis for all this time? You know this really didn't happen. What happened to Travis after we took off in that truck, I can't tell you. I hated Travis for a long time after this. My whole world just tore up. But I believe every word Travis said about it. He's never lied to me about nothing. It's a net negative. We lost our jobs in the immediate aftermath. And now you're not able to talk about it with anyone because you know that they're going to laugh at you, they're going to look at you like you're crazy. But if you don't come out and tell your story, somebody else is going to tell it for you. There's a degree of responsibility. Uh, certainly, I have to accept the bad. If I can direct what's happened in a way that I can make something good happen in the world, I'm looking for it. Order your copy of Travis, the true story of Travis Walton, today at www.travaswaltonthemovie.com. 
Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the Exome Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, High Tech with Corey Kay, and every minute of the 24-7, 365 programming of the Exome Broadcast Network by calling 712-432-9459, courtesy of TalkStream Live. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 712-432-9459 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember, 712-432-9459 for the best of paranormal, new age, thought-provoking, sci-fi radio programming 24-7, 365. Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? Well then, meet Dr. Kimberly McGeorge and her cutting-edge breakthrough knowledge that combines science with possibility. Dr. Kimberly brings real-life answers and healing to those open to alternative solutions. She teaches solution-based programs and classes that will change all areas of your life forever. Specializing in conscious creation, intuitive readings, and energy medicine, you can rapidly shift health, relationships, business, and money and abundance challenges quickly. Receive her best-selling book, Secret to Everything, at no cost by going to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone. That's right. Transformation can start now. Just go to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone and receive Dr. Kimberly's book for free. While science pursues fact, magic accesses the quantum level, bridging random facts to form truth. As long as science and magic remain separate and polarized, the truth cannot be known. I'm Gwilda Wiecka. Join me on the Science of Magic radio program, dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. During each episode, I'll be speaking with experienced and respected scientists and mystics. From astrologers to astronomers, from medical doctors to shaman, the scientific method to dowsing and intuition, we'll weave together information from seemingly divergent practices to promote unity and enlightenment. Join me, Gwilda Wiyaka, and the Science of Magic right here on the Mutual Broadcast Network. For more information, visit www.thescienceofmagic.net. I am Dr. Carl O'Helvey, founder, president of a new cancer foundation focusing on evidence-based physical, mental, and spiritual interventions, including natural cancer cures, prayer, meditation, affirmations, nutrition, and other related holistic cancer prevention and cure modalities. These are used in cancer education, research, and financing care. I ask for your help to continue this important work by donating at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. Michael Varhola is our special guest. We're talking about America's Haunted Road Trip this hour. Michael is one of the authors of Ghost Hunting Maryland that is going to be released this coming September. He's had a lifelong interest in the paranormal and has conducted investigations worldwide. He is a public speaker, author of several books, and a freelance journalist with a strong background in history, research, and fieldwork. He lives in Virginia, just outside of Washington, D.C. And, uh, Michael, oh, how do you conduct your research? Well, the kind of research I do is not necessarily the same kind of research that you see paranormal investigators on TV doing. And I don't make any claims to be anything more than a travel writer. That's essentially what I'm doing. I I am researching out the actual history of any of the places that we encounter, Mm -hmm. uh, that we want to include. I am researching out uh, the haunted history of the place, which often includes uh, interviewing people who are associated with the place. 
uh, and then I'm going out and I'm putting boots on the ground and I'm visiting the place. And what I actually do when I'm out there varies. Sometimes I'm just going out and visiting the site and talking to the people that run it. Uh, sometimes, if it's a hotel or a bed and breakfast, I will actually stay there for two or three days uh, so that I can get more of a hands-on sense of the place. Sometimes I'll set up the camera on the tripod and I'll take a lot of digital photography in, in certain areas, especially ones that uh, are purported to have had paranormal phenomena. Sometimes I will run the recorder and try to pick up some EVPs. Uh, and I always just try to leave my mind open and be sensitive to what's going on around me. So I'm not necessarily conducting uh, a full paranormal investigation to the standards that, that some uh, paranormal investigators do, because that's really not what I'm about. What I'm about is telling people how they can get out to sites and conduct their own investigations. So the level of investigation I conduct varies but I always go out to the site, and I always tell people what they need to know to be able to go out to the site themselves. Does a belief in ghosts coincide or conflict with traditional religious beliefs, Michael? I don't think it, it necessarily does. I think traditional religious beliefs can color mm -hmm. uh, the meaning people take away from ghost hunting. Uh, so, for example, uh, somebody was just posting to the America's Haunted Trip uh, website, uh, America's Haunted Road Trip website, um, a reference to the Old Testament story about King Saul visiting the witch of Endor uh, and the uh, biblical injunction that comes out of his visit to the witch of Endor, who is a necromancer, who speaks with, with ghosts mm -hmm. and tries to derive information from them. Uh, this disquieted this, uh, this gentleman a bit, and he was wondering, okay, can I be a Christian and, and can I be a ghost hunter? Why not? Uh, so it, it, his, his belief in the existence of ghosts was not affected, uh, but whether he felt comfortable from a religious point of view going out and, and hunting for them was. Um, and really, people who uh, completely dismiss religion um, uh, or the supernatural per se altogether might still believe uh, that ghosts exist, but that they are just not uh, a supernatural phenomena. Uh, for example, I mentioned uh, the Stephen Browdy, Dr. Mm -hmm. Browdy. He believes they're externalizations of, of telekinesis. So... Uh, you know, I think people's religious background and their, their beliefs and whatever dogmas they adhere to are going to color how they approach ghost hunting, whether they approach ghost hunting, uh, how they, they uh, interpret these various phenomena. But you get people of all sorts of beliefs uh, involved in this, this, um, this phenomena now. Are there any specific um, uh, ghosts that are more frequently seen than others? Yes, there are more sorts of ghosts. I, I, I think I, I understand the sense of your question here, uh, but correct me, redirect me if you think you need to. There are some specific ghosts that are seen a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was reading John Kachuba's uh, book, Ghost Hunting Illinois, and I believe you, you've spoken with uh, John Many, before. many, many times. He's a great guy. He's our series editor. He's a great guy. Uh, he mentions a number of, of sites in his book where Lincoln's ghost is purported uh, to have been spotted. And when I did ghost hunting in Virginia, which included Washington, D.C., I mentioned a number of sites where Lincoln's ghost is purported to have been seen. Mm -hmm. uh, so ghosts like Lincoln, ghosts of famous people, ghosts like Lincoln, Washington, uh, they turn up in multiple sites. And that is problematic. <laughs> and, and it is something that ghost hunters sort of have to... Um, uh, at least try to address uh, when they're investigating a site and, and the ghost of Abraham Lincoln is associated with it, and you know very well that the ghost of Abraham Lincoln is associated with 12 other sites, well, what does that mean? Um, and it can mean any, any number of things. But, yes, uh, there, are, there are some ghosts that are more frequently encountered than others. That brings, uh, that brings up another question. How can a ghost be in two places at the same time? Well, I don't think a ghost can be in two places at the same time. I think you're, you're dealing with a couple of things. Um, one possibility is that you're looking at what, what we referred to earlier as a residual haunting. It's not really an intelligent ghost per se. It's not really the spirit of the person. It's some sort of psychic energy or psychic residue, uh, you know, a snapshot of the past. Mm -hmm. And you can have multiple snapshots. You can only have one person, uh, you know, in one place at a time for all practical purposes. But you could have many pictures of that person. So that might be something that we're dealing with with regard to someone like Lincoln. Uh, another is that you might genuinely have a ghost, but 
people are lazy. People are lazy. People are not necessarily very imaginative. Uh, and if you've got a, a guy in a powdered wig who has been spotted haunting a house down in Williamsburg, Virginia, well, God help him, people are just going to call him George Washington. Uh, so the fact that George Washington haunts uh, any number of dozens of places uh, in Virginia uh, I, I don't think that's a coincidence. Uh, any of those places could be haunted, but it isn't really George Washington that's there. It's either residual haunting on the one hand or some other 18th century fellow who uh, people look at and say, oh, well, that must be George Washington, and they don't bother to go any further. And frankly, if, if there is any truth to that statement that I just made at all, uh, you would think that would antagonize a ghost. If a ghost is actually lingering about for whatever reasons, if something has kept the spirit of a person on this plane for whatever reason, and every time he pops up and tries to, to give whatever message uh, he's trying to give so that he can, can be free and move on, and people say, oh, look, it's George Washington, uh, I, think, I think that's probably just antagonizing them. So, so uh, I, I, think, I think those are the two main things you're looking at. Uh, and then the third thing is, is something which I, I think is less common, but it could happen. Uh, there's actually no haunting at all. And, and people are simply making the claim that there's one, uh, that a famous person is haunting for purposes of, of publicity or drawing attention to themselves. And I suspect that happened. Uh, many, very many, often. many times. Yeah. Uh, ghost, uh, ghost hauntings bring revenue for a number of bars, pubs, and restaurants and hotels. Well, you know, uh, Rob, you are right. And that is why it is so ironic yep. that if you contact a bar, restaurant, or hotel... And I'm in South Dakota right now visiting my daughter. I actually came out here for purposes of taking her to a funeral. Oh my uh, and I came out on short notice, and I thought, okay, well, let's see if I can't get out to some of the haunted sites, say, in Deadwood mm -hmm. or downtown uh, Rapid City. And I've contacted a number of, of hotels and other institutions, and uh, there's dead silence on the other end. <laughs> None of them are getting back to me. And I don't know why, because... Uh, I guarantee when I go up and visit them incognito tomorrow, uh, it's going to be pretty quiet, and it wouldn't divert them at all to have me broadcasting from there tonight. So, um, or speaking, you know, to you from there tonight. So, um, yeah, I don't know. You're right. It, it, it does help businesses, but it's amazing the number of businesses that are completely entrenched against even declining uh, an offer of an investigation or inclusion in a book. Hmm. Uh, why does a ghost? haunt a specific place. For example, if the ghost, if a person didn't die in the bar, why would his ghost be there? Well, the person might have a strong emotional connection to the place. Oh, like uh, his that favorite haunt, one so reason. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, maybe that bar was the most important place in the world to that person. And uh, just on some visceral level, that's where they felt they were supposed to be. Uh, so that's, that's one possibility, that they died somewhere else mm -hmm. and they kind of came home. Um, another possibility uh, is uh, the phenomenon of the hitchhiking ghost. And this is, is not a theory of my own. It's not necessarily one that I'm, I'm uh, trying to sell. But I have heard this a number of times um, from people who run beds and breakfasts or hotels, that there is no history to a particular ghost that's affiliated with their place. And they believe it was carried in by someone else and somehow just felt that it was at home and decided to stay. Uh, so that's another uh, possibility, that uh, a ghost has come in with someone mm -hmm. and um, not left with them. So those, those are a couple of possibilities. Why do people go to graveyards to see ghosts? Why wouldn't people go to graveyards to see ghosts, right? Well, the, well, the people didn't die there. All, you've got no. in, all you have in a graveyard is, is a empty biological unit. Yeah, and uh, there are a number of people who would agree that because of that, ghosts are less likely to be encountered in graveyards. But in practice, uh, ghosts do, in fact, get encountered in graveyards. Uh, and I'm not sure exactly why. Uh, maybe the spirit lingers with that, that uh, empty biological unit for a little while. Uh, and if that person was not happy about being killed, the fact that there's burial ritual, uh, which is intended for the living in a sense. It's, it's to help the living uh, walk away from the dead person and, and move on with their lives. It's not necessarily intended to help the dead person move on. Um, the fact that a person is buried uh, in a cemetery is not necessarily uh, going to, to help their spirit move on, and uh, it isn't necessarily going to preclude uh, uh, 
a ghost lingering about where that person's body was. Uh, it might reduce the chance of it, but, you know, it's a numbers game. Even if it reduces the chance of a ghost being there by half or, or 90%, you know, a certain number, I think, could still turn up. I have uh, heard too many stories of ghostly phenomena um, associated with cemeteries to, to, you know, dismiss the possibility that, that, that there are ghosts in them. I, I think the key word in your last statement was, I've heard a lot of stories. Now, how many ghosts have you actually seen yourself in a, in a cemetery? Uh, well, you know, I'll tell you, uh, I've never seen a ghost uh, in real time myself anywhere. Uh, the closest I've seen uh, to seeing a ghost in real time is when I uh, have been in, in a couple of different haunted sites, sites that I would go on the record as saying I believe to be haunted. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I took a digital photo, uh, there's you know generally a little image that will linger on the, the digital camera screen for a couple seconds after, after you take a photo. Uh, when I've taken a digital photo, I'll see a black screen with a little tiny dot on it. And then when I've gone in later and zoomed in on that dot, it has been a phenomena such as an orb, for example. So that's the closest that I have knowingly ever come to seeing a ghost in real time. So I haven't actually seen a ghost uh, in a cemetery or anywhere else per se. Do you give orbs any credibility? I certainly don't. I give them quite a lot of credibility. Why? I, well, I'll tell you why. Um, I know all the reasons uh, why they are dismissed, mm -hmm. but I can tell the difference between a speck of dust, for example, or a bit of moisture on my lens, uh, and what uh, and the effects that it produces. And, and those are two of the main uh, dismissals that are given for orbs. I'll tell you, I take several thousand digital photographs a year, uh -huh. every single year under all sorts of conditions, all sorts of places, all sorts of conditions, all sorts of light conditions, moisture conditions, uh, climactic conditions, and I have only ever found compelling orbs at seven different places, seven different places, all the thousands of photos in hundreds of sites that I've taken digital photography, I have only ever found orbs in seven different places and they have all been purportedly haunted sites, and they are all among the sites that I would go on the record as saying that, that I believe to be haunted. All right, so what do you think an orb is? I think an orb is some sort of spiritual residue. I think it is uh, what you could call, for lack of a better term, a ghost. I think it is the residue, uh, the, the remains, uh, spiritual remains of, of what was formerly a person, or possibly an animal. A living biological unit. I don't know. I, I'm, you know, I, I've seen so many phony photos of orbs doing the show for the last 17 years that somebody starts talking to me about orbs. I say, oh, oh, here we go, woo woo farm again. Well, I, you know, rather than try to convince you, what I, I, I would respond with saying is, I don't try to convince people of anything, mm -hmm. and. I, I agree with you, Rob. I agree with you. If somebody comes to me with a photo that I didn't take, that they took, yeah. I tend to be a little bit skeptical. I really do. Uh, and you've got to consider your source. So when I tell you what I just told you, I am not pretending that I have just offered you proof of anything. You've just All you've I, taken the photo. You can't explain it. And the best of your, uh, to the best of your knowledge, it's an orb. I'm telling you what I think it is. All right, I've got to take a commercial break. We'll be back on the other side in four minutes. This is the Exxon on the Talk Star Radio Network. My name's Rob McConnell. We'll be back right after this. Word from our fine sponsors here on the Talk Star Radio Network. Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? Well, then, meet Dr. Kimberly McGeorge and her cutting edge breakthrough knowledge that combines science with possibility. Dr. Kimberly brings real-life answers and healing to those open to alternative solutions. She teaches solution-based programs and classes that will change all areas of your life forever. Specializing in conscious creation, intuitive readings, and energy medicine, you can rapidly shift health, relationships, business, and money and abundance challenges quickly. Receive her best-selling book, Secret to Everything, at no cost by going to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone. That's right. Transformation can start now. 
Just go to secrettoeverything.com forward slash Xone and receive Dr. Kimberly's book for free. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the Exome Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, High Tech with Corey Kay, and every minute of the 24-7, 365 programming of the Exome Broadcast Network by calling 712-432-9459, courtesy of TalkStream Live. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 712-432-9459 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember, 712-432-9459 for the best of paranormal, new age, thought-provoking, sci-fi radio programming 24-7, 365. Coming soon to the Exxon Broadcast Network is a different perspective with me, Kevin Randall, as your host. We'll be taking a close look at what is happening in the world of UFOs today with side trips into the paranormal. Guests will range from those who are household names to those who have a different perspective on a variety of topics. No topic will be taboo, but there will be tough questions asked as we all search for the truth about UFOs, the paranormal, and those things that excite us. Sometimes we'll agree with a guest and sometimes we won't, but we'll try to keep the program topical. For those of you who would like to read, be sure to visit www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com and remember to listen to the other fine programs on the X-Zone Broadcast Network at www.xzbn.net. This is Kevin Randall. For nearly 30 years, I have been investigating the case of the Roswell UFO. I have interviewed hundreds of people and stood on the crash site. Now in Roswell in the 21st century, I have reviewed dozens of hours of audio and videotaped interviews, examined hundreds of files that relate to the crash, and have returned to Roswell in an attempt to put all that information into the proper perspective. For the first time in Roswell in the 21st century, I have made a dispassionate reevaluation of all that material and provide a new look at what happened. This is a book that clears away all the clutter that has hidden the truth for so long, strips away the various lies that surround the case, exposes the Air Force attempts at cover-up, and found a core of solid information that tells us all where the case stands today. Roswell in the 21st Century will be available in just a few weeks. For more information, please visit my website at www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. What Happened in Benghazi is revealed by Nicholas Genix, author of Obama, Islam, and Benghazi. He informs the American people that President Obama deceived them by advocating a strong foreign policy prior to the 2012 presidential election, and Hillary Clinton supported this deception. As the title infers, there is a connection between Obama, Islam, and Benghazi. Ample evidence informs Americans that Obama's early indoctrination in the Quran developed an infinity for Islam, why the Quran is the source of discontent in many countries, and why the Obama foreign policy deception led to poor military action and caused the loss of American lives in Benghazi. Genix provides 36 questions for the Select Committee on Benghazi to validate if Americans are justified to mistrust President Obama and Hillary Clinton. An overview of Obama, Islam, and Benghazi is presented on the website www.futureofgodamen.com. That's www.futureofgodamen.com. Afterlife expert Roberta Grimes was the first one to say that dying can be fun. Now her best-selling book, The Fun of Dying, is available in stores worldwide. So if you wonder whether death ends life, how it feels to die, or what heaven might be like, The Fun of Dying was written for you. And if you have always been afraid of death, or if you worry that your life is no meaning, let The Fun of Dying ease your fears and bring new meaning to your life. Nothing said in The Fun of Dying is based on the teachings of any religion. Instead, Roberta draws on evidence to explain how death happens, how it feels, and what comes next. 
A lot of the best death-related evidence was produced in the first half of the 20th century. When it is put together with recent discoveries, it tells a consistent and amazing story. Roberta Grimes blogs and answers questions at robertagrimes.com. Her wonderful book, The Fun of Dying, is available on Amazon and at stores worldwide wherever books are sold. We're talking about America's Haunted Road Trip. Our guest is Michael Varhola. We're talking about his book. Well, he's one of the authors of Ghost Hunting Maryland. It uh, is being released in September of this year. And um, was your experience writing Ghost Hunting Maryland any different from Ghost Hunting Virginia? Well, the main difference is that uh, my father is my co-author on Ghost Hunting Maryland. Uh, He always wanted to be an author when he grew up, and... uh, he wrote a couple of chapters in Ghost Hunting Virginia, and he's going to be writing, is in the process of writing about a quarter of, of Ghost Hunting Maryland. So that's one of the biggest uh, differences, that uh, some of the heavy lifting is being picked up by someone else, and he's gone out to a number of the sites with me. So, so that's, that's the main difference. Did you learn anything uh, last time that you have utilized in researching these haunted sites? Yeah, I think my my uh, uh, the approach is 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 better. I think mm-hmm. I'm I'm more thorough uh, than I am uh, than I was before in my investigation. So certainly, you know, uh, if you're at all good at what you do, you get better at it. So this book, in many ways, will be a better book. Uh, one example of that was that we covered three dozen sites in Virginia. We gave chapter length treatment to three dozen sites, and we will do that in Ghost Hunting Maryland as well. But then we will also have an appendix of however many publicly accessible, purportedly haunted sites we can find. So whether that's 50 or 100, we'll give a one paragraph each treatment to in an appendix of the book. So in a sense, the book will be comprehensive. It will, be, it will include, to one extent or another, every uh, purportedly haunted site uh, we can find in the state of Maryland that's publicly accessible. So I think that's a, a major improvement. What do you think about the uh, city of Gettysburg uh, starting to cut down on the ghost uh, tours? You know, i I, I got to be honest with you, Rob. I live in microcosms dictated by whatever I happen to be writing. And Gettysburg isn't in Maryland, Virginia, so I, I just don't keep track of what's going on out there. Working on these books and doing the, the legwork on them mm-hmm. is just so all-consuming. I really put on blinders and try not to pay attention to what's going on uh, in, in other sites. I, I will say uh, that I think it's unfortunate, that it's somewhat deplorable, that this this activity gets treated as being somehow uh, more aberrant than reenacting, say. Uh, ghost hunters are taxpayers like everyone else, and if we're talking about a publicly accessible place, then their rights to access and to uh, enjoy the site how they see fit shouldn't be abridged any more than anybody else's. Well, I, I hate to disagree with you there, but, you know, I've seen a lot of these ghost hunters uh, that are, you know, two can short of a six-pack. And, you know, they, they, they do cause a little bit of damage. They do, they do not uh, always obey the law. They don't understand that private property is private property. You know, so I can't blame these cities for cracking down and saying enough is enough. Anyway, Michael, thanks very much. We've got to say so long for now. Michael is the author of Ghost Hunting Maryland. It's part of America's Haunted Road Trip. We'll be back on the other side of the news as the Exxon continues live and around the world on the Talk Star Radio Network from our studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. 1-877-528-8255 is toll free. And um, you're listening to us live and around the world on the Talk Star Radio Network.